outside so that people could pick up and if we weren't teaching in an area like if you're teaching in Jeremiah you're not going to cover the Sermon on the Mount very often and so I developed little books and I'm going to pass this around and you can look through here and on the top of each one there's a little a little a note paper if you want a copy of this booklet or this sheet of, or this collection of papers write your name on the one that you want and over time I will <laughs> produce these for you and get them back to you everybody understand that Okay, we'll start with, she lives with the author, so you don't need to worry about that. Also, we got rid of the, of the parables book. Um, tell me what you understand about Calvinism and what Calvinism happens to be. And you'll hear me use both terms, doctrines of grace and Calvinism, but Calvinism is the term most people know it by today. Tell me what you know. Okay, that makes the feel pretty clear. All right, good. <laughs> this week's lesson is going to be a, uh, a short course, a short spurt through history of how the church came to these doctrines and, and what it is developed as and, and, and in reality is. Morning, Dimitri. Good to see you, brother. What brought you down here today other than the Lord? Okay. Okay. Amen. <laughs> How's it going? Amen. That's good. We, we continue to pray for you and the family. Okay? Amen. I think Calvinism is a, uh, a God-centered view of salvation. Correct. Which kind of sum up all the points and uh, it's not left to man, but it's to him. Uh, and which I would in turn say is a biblical view of uh, our various doctrines of salvation. Correct. And... Uh, you can expect one of two responses normally when you bring up the topic of Calvinism. You can either pucker up because someone's going to kiss you because they love you because of that, or they're going to throw something at you and you better duck, okay, because they see the, the, the doctrines of grace as heresy, and they see it as something that it is not. It is in reality. I like to compare it uh, to turning the tumblers on a safe and finding finally that combination that brings it together and you open the safe and inside that safe are the doctrines of grace. It is the truth about how salvation works and it, it, it hones everything that we do as believers. It sharpens everything that we do so that we can give the right gospel out. I, the last thing you wanna be doing is giving someone a false sense of what their salvation is. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't wanna tell, I was raised in a in an environment where uh, the productivity of the church was measured by how many decisions were made that week. Do you know what I'm saying? How many people answered the altar call uh, when there's really no altar other than the, well, the th altar that's in heaven? Uh, how many people responded? Uh, I once heard a young preacher say uh, he was exhorting the church that he was teaching and he was saying, you people need to bring in more people, pack in those pews, I can't win an empty pew. See what I'm saying? He was leaving salvation up to his persuasiveness, up to his ability to coerce someone to make a certain decision, and, a, and that's not what the truth of Scripture has to say. Uh, I'm, I'm interested and encouraged by what I see as a resurgent in the, in the, uh, the writings of Puritans and, and Reformation fathers because therein is what, something we can put in our hands. I want to recommend a book to you. This is a, a little condensation of a book done by, uh, in 1525 by Martin Luther called The Bondage of the Will. And in it, he answers the arguments of a man that we'll refer to a little bit later on named Erasmus. And he talks to, and he talks to Erasmus and talks about the reality and we'll cover total depravity next week, Lord willing, but this is the topic. You can buy this, uh, uh, I've, I've gone through several, I've gone through several of them. This is the last one I have in my library or else you could have it, but if you really want it, you can have it anyhow, I'll get another one. But uh, I recommend this to you as a primer uh, to understanding the, the concept of total depravity. Uh, therefore, I love the Puritans. Uh, what would you think of someone who says you should not read the Puritans because they'll mess your mind up? What would you think about a person like that? Ah, very well said. They have a point of view that does not agree with, uh, with what we're going to see as biblical Christianity. There are times when, when these doctrines are well-loved and times 
uh, sad to say, in America. Uh, I was raised in, in a church environment that uh, a little town in simple Illinois, 2,400 people, a farm town, and we used to look forward to August every year because that's when the traveling revival show would show up. I saw uh, Oral Roberts, and it, you, some of you are old enough to remember Oral Roberts. I remember when he was in his Elvis Presley age where he had a big hairdo and a white suit, and he would bring the traveling salvation show every year to our little town, and they would set up a tent on the edge of town, and they would, they would hold revival meetings. Okay? And everybody in church would go. We had three churches in town, different denominations, but everybody would go to the, go to the revival meeting, and everything would be hoopla, and then Saturday night would show up again, and the same people that were at the revival meeting would show up at Scotty's Tavern. You know what I'm saying? There was no, it was just, it was something to do during the summertime in the heat of August in that little town. Our lesson starting today is intended to, to teach us a little bit about the history that's going to aid uh, and, uh, and give us an appreciation for how these doctrines have developed. Charles Spurgeon said this, quote, you cannot preach the gospel of Jesus Christ unless you preach what is called Calvinism. It is a nickname because Calvinism is nothing other than the pure and simple gospel. We cannot preach any gospel that isn't the sovereignty of God, the grace of God, and the depravity of man. Unless we exult in the electing, unchangeable, immutable, all-conquering love of Jehovah, we have no gospel. Nor can we preach the gospel unless we base it upon the special, particular, redemption of his elect people who he alone preserves to the very end. And Spurgeon in that remark gave us all five points. He gave us total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, preservation of the saints. That's the five points in English. Uh, it's funny that, that uh, they associate a flower, the tulip, with Calvinism I often like to associate a flower with Arminianism, okay? The daisy, he loves me, he loves me not. He <laughs> loves me, he, okay, those of you that understand know what I'm talking about, and, and, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. We want to start with, uh, with a quote from Romans chapter 11. Paul writes and he says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. I mean, you could stop at that remark and, and dwell on that for a month, couldn't you? How much does God understand about how everything is operating? Perfectly. Everything. He's the one who set it in motion, right? He's the one. And Paul says, that word, that little O at the start, it's, it's, an, excl it's an exclamation. O! Oh! Think about that. How deep... Is, and rich is the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who becomes his counselor or who has first given to him that it might be repaid to him? What book in the Old Testament does that remark bring to you? Job, instantly, okay? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And I will add another amen to that. I will compound that. Believing these doctrines will always put you in the minority. It's sad to say. The church systems that most of us were raised in or reared in that we know historically are not Calvinistic in their background. You'll not know if you're new to Christ or if this is the only church experience you've ever had you'll not know how bad churches can really get whenever they get off on a program system that is simply designed to fill the seats and to fill the coffers. Nickels and noses is what I used to call it. Uh, and I speak to you as a person who comes from a background who used to think it was okay to give people hamburgers to bring other people to, to church. Okay, confessions of a converted Arminian. I went to a local McDonald's, I bought coupons for McDonald's hamburgers and gave them to someone if they'd bring someone else to church. Okay, you say, shame on you. Yes, it was. And then I had the, God had the great grace to send along a missionary friend of mine who came along. I asked him one day, I said, 
this was shortly after I went in the pastor, and I said, I, I've been preaching for six months and I'm having trouble finding a text to preach next week. He said, have you ever considered preaching through a book in the Bible? I said, you can do that? He says, yeah, you start at the first and you end at the, when the thing is over. I said, oh, that's amazing. I said, what should I do first? He said, oh, why don't you try Ephesians? Well, guess what he introduced me to? The doctrines of grace, because that's the, that's the point of what Paul wrote. Just because these doctrines are so hated doesn't mean that we are not to declare them. We're to declare them rightly and openly and fully and without being ashamed of any of them. It is these things which make a soul free. Uh, our brother Tom will offer his testimony, and he says when God decided to save him, his only prayer was, God, save me from me. See? Release me from what I have been counting on as my spirituality and give me what you truly alone can give. And that is the testimony of someone who has truly been redeemed. Save me from me. Because... We are created as spiritual beings, as worshiping beings. That's what human beings are created to do. God put Adam and Eve in the garden to glorify him and to worship him. The same reason we are here. And if we refuse to do that, we are falling to the ploy of what our society today calls a positive self-image. I have a self-image. I understand, well, uh, uh, look at Matthew chapter 5 and let me show you God's image of someone who is truly redeemed. You guys know what Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are, right? What's it called? It's called the, Beati yeah, the Beatitudes started out. This is the first recorded sermon of Christ. I love dealing in first, okay? How does God, when he opens his mouth on earth, incarnate as Jesus Christ, describe someone who is truly saved. Blessed are the, what? Poor in spirit. Blessed are those who? Blessed are those who are? Blessed are those who? Blessed are the? Blessed are the? Blessed are the? Blessed are the and blessed are the persecuted, right? So where in there is a positive self-image? The positive character of this is I realize how bad off I truly am and I trust in him for salvation alone. Do you grasp that? It is not doing this. Oh, look at me, I got saved last week. I got baptized last week, see? That's what, that's what Arminian theology will do to you. I've been accused of being divisive because I preach the doctrines of grace. I'm not divisive. I'm doctrinally exact. I refuse to believe something that does not give me, that does not give God all the glory in anything that occurs. Doctrine divides, they tell me. You shouldn't preach doctrine. You shouldn't teach doctrine. I became anathema to a group of pastors over in Europe because I preach the doctrines of grace. And it didn't sit well with them. Doctrine does not divide, does it? Error divides. I'm in harmony, I'm in total agreement with everyone who believes that God is supreme over me. That he doesn't need me, that he created me with a certain purpose and my life is going about to fulfill that purpose. God has determined what is true. I don't determine what is true, he determines what is true. All I'm asked to do with the gifts that he gives me is take this book and portray it as it is written. I don't bring my own agenda to this book. Um, I went for a short while to, a, to a, a, a pastor's meeting on Mondays after we would have our Sunday services, and it seemed like most of the time they were saying, well, I had eight decisions yesterday, or we, we got in $45,000 or something like that. And I said, you guys, if you keep competing for numbers, you're gonna lose to the Roman Catholics every week because they have more people than you do. They get more money than you do. Their devices are more effective at doing what they want to get done. And they're showing themselves by what, they, by what they prioritize. I don't defend these doctrines. I'll explain them and then I'll face the critics and they can criticize the one who wrote these doctrines. All I have to do is get 
as precise and as exact with these doctrines of grace as I can, as God allows, with clarity. When I go to someone and I proclaim to them that they are a sinner and God is a savior, I'm not trying to convince them of something that I say is right. I'm trying to relate to them with, and, and that's, where the, that's where the loving them comes in. They're going to know that I have their best interest at heart and not accumulating a group of numbers or a group of, group of converts to myself. Dwight Moody was walking with Spurgeon through London when Moody went over on a campaign over there. And, and they're walking along the streets of London, which weren't very pretty in the late 1800s. And there's a man laying in the gutter and, and Spurgeon says to Moody, look, that's one of my converts. <coughs> Moody said, what? He says, yes, that's one of my converts. Not one of God's converts, because why? God's converts uh, give up the bottle. They don't, they don't continue to suck on it. What is Calvinism then? Okay, I've been told this about a Calvinist. Calvinists don't witness because they're fatalist. Let go and let God, they say. Is that true? Am I a fatalist because I believe God is sovereign? No, I'm a realist. God is sovereign, is he not? Can I get you to shake that? Let me hear the nut rolling around in there. Okay. God is sovereign. If he's not sovereign, something else is, and that's what I'm going to worship, the thing that's sovereign to, the, to Yahweh. I'm going to worship Yahweh. He's sovereign in all of us. They also say God does not, uh, they say that God predestines some people to go to hell. Do people go to hell because God walks through life and says, hell, hell, heaven, hell, hell, heaven, hell. Is that why? Is that how it works? No. Everybody's destined for, for hell. And God walks through death row and he says, Grace, grace, and he doesn't say because you're cute or because you go to this church or because you've been baptized. He does it in a will and a way that doesn't tell us why he does it that way or how he does it that way. He simply does it. None of us deserves heaven, do we? We don't, be honest about it. We deserve to be a bug on the windshield at 65 miles an hour, splat. God has a plan. He's working through that plan. In the process of that plan, he has elect before the foundation of the universe, certain among lost mankind, all born as the seed of Adam, carrying the same traits as Adam, carrying the curse of Adam from the garden of rebellion. Any of us, if you don't think that man is born a sinner, work in the nursery. No one has to teach those little sinners how to sin set a red ball in the middle of the room and put them against the wall and say, don't touch. And then leave the room and watch the survival of the fittest, right? <laughs> I'm also told that as a Calvinist, I'm wrong in offering the gospel openly to everybody. What's wrong with that remark? Do I know who the elect are? If I knew who the elect are, I wouldn't, I wouldn't proclaim the gospel as I do. I wouldn't be a fool for Christ. I would simply go and I'd pull up their shirt and see if there's an E on their back, and then I would put it down and say, okay, listen to me, this is the gospel. That's what I do. No, understanding the doctrines of grace makes you an evangelist because you understand it's not you having to convince them. He's the one doing the saving. You're carrying the meal to them, see? And so that can make you, you're invincible. Who can harm me? Kill me, okay, go ahead, uh, hurt me, you know, take me out. I'm told that God saves some people against their will. Is that true? No. That's the, the eye and the tulip that we'll get to when we get there. What are the New Testament principles that Christ and his disciples taught? Scripture absolutely teaches the utter, utter inability of man to save himself. There is no such thing in Scripture as co-salvation. God does his part and waits for you to do your part. That's not how it works. God saves you. And just as naturally in your lostness you acted a certain way, in your new creationness, I'm a preacher, I can make up words, okay? You will act a certain way. There is a reality to that newness. The first thing a new child does when it comes out of the womb is cries, right? Why does that baby cry? Hmm. I think that somehow God is uh, 
God is, is merciful in, in letting that child know. At credit in this entire thing is who gets the credit for salvation? Do you get the credit or part of it and God get the rest of it or is it all of God? Yes, Tom. Babies are vipers born in diapers. <laughs> vipers born in diapers. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have the next slide. <laughs> the New Testament says that God saves in such a way so that all the glory goes to him. In John chapter 6, Jesus, Jesus says this, Therefore, and this is near the end of it, near verse 60, many of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, and what is this? What, what had they heard in John chapter 6? That God is the one doing the saving. Realize that Jesus came into the most religious environment that the earth had ever known, into Judaism. They were the religion of the religions. You just ask them, they'll tell you, okay? They still think that they are, that they were God's chosen people, but they were chosen for the job of being witnesses of the goodness and sovereignty of God. They weren't fulfilling it. And Jesus comes along in John chapter 6 near the end, and he delivers his powerful message that says, I'm the only way. I am the truth and the light. It's only me and trusting in me, not in your own works. And at that point, many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? In other words, you're ripping salvation away from my capacity, my ability, and you're putting it on yourself alone? You mean, you mean you don't need anything from us? But Jesus, <laughs> that's a powerful adversative, but. I can say you're the most beautiful thing in the world, but what I've just done with that word but is negate everything before it, okay? Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What's your problem, ducky? You don't understand what I said? I thought I was clear with that. What then? If you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before, the Spirit, the Spirit is the one who gives life. Who has he said this to before? In John's Gospel, three chapters before that. Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes all full of himself with a simple question he thinks. He's going to approach this simple man from Nazareth. And he walks into Jesus. He makes a remark. And Jesus looks at him and says, you must be born from above. <laughs> Nicodemus at that point says, I didn't ask you that. No. He goes off on his own. Jesus stays on point. Unless the Spirit births you, the Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh profits a little bit. Is that what God said? You mean I don't contribute anything to my salvation? No. The Spirit gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are Spirit and are life. Listen, listen, listen. How many of you thought you were saved before you were saved? See? You were doing what the system called on you to do, right? You were being the best little whatever it is at that point that you could be. God says, no. But there are some of you who do not believe. Go into a religious situation. Declare this. I've often said I'd rather witness to bikers than Baptist. The biker knows his situation, right? Hmm. I was raised a Baptist, by the way, so I can say those things. I'm a Baptist. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus also said in John, I've come to seek and save that which was lost. I've come to call sinners to repentance. Look at Romans 10. Paul gives us 
a clear proclamation of the gospel in the first 11 chapters of Romans. And then as he gets near the end, he says in, in chapter 10 and verse 2, he says, For I testify about Israel, about them, that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. The problem is explained in verse 3, for not knowing about the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. There's something that happens with this new birth thing that you really need to grasp. Before God births you, you were doing what is true to your nature and character. You're being what you are, lost. And find yourself doing lost things. And if you have some modicum of, of, uh, of morality, maybe when you do something immoral, you feel bad about it and you, you say, well, I'm going to take the pledge and I'm going to knock it off and I'm not going to do it anymore. And you wind up being a good moral person. Someone comes along, God comes along, and he opens his word, his truth, because how shall they hear without it being proclaimed to them, the truth of who God is, he says in chapter 9. Therefore, we go out as evangelists and we declare the righteousness of God to people. I've, I've been a student of revival, both biblical and, and historical, for most of my adult Christian life. I've studied revivals. The first revival... Uh, uh, there were eight converts. When did that happen? At the flood. See? He was alive already, but now he's re-live. Okay? Conversion has occurred. There was a revival on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 were saved. A few days later, 5,000 were saved. The message didn't change. What was Peter's message in Acts? God promised you a savior, he came and you killed him, and guess what? He's coming back. That's the Wilson Revised Version of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. He declared the righteousness of God. There have been revivals throughout history, that were one that we call the Reformation. That was a two century long revival of real new birth coming into a world of darkness. You know what they call the centuries from zero to 1,000 or 12 or 13 to about 13 to 1,400? They called them the dark ages. Revival happened in the 1500s. Uh, before the 1500s, uh, a guy named Savannah Rolla was preaching, a monk, a Roman Catholic monk was preaching in Italy. A guy named Zwingli was preaching uh, in Austria and Hungary along with John Hus. And then this, this, uh, this uh, monk in Wittenberg, Germany, comes along, and he says, no, 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 no. Indulgences don't do you any good. You must be born again. See, that revival went on. There was a lull in the 1600s, and at late 1600s, Puritans were writing and doing things. And then in the 1700s, there was a revival in England and Scotland and Wales, which found its way over to what we call the colonies. And that revival, the reality of that revival was, was that almost within a short period of time, so many people were converted that society in and of itself changed. People became better, not because they were moral now, but because they were born again and they were obeying a righteous, holy God who had a standard to live by. Along comes the Civil War, the revival goes whoosh. The revolution, okay, the Revolutionary War. And then in the 1830s, another revival starts in what we now call the United States under a man named Ashel Nettleton. It is quenched again by another war called the Civil War. But these great revivals have come along. They've been marvelous throughout our history. What happens when I, when I introduce human works into the salvation process that God alone is performing. How much arsenic does it take to poison a thousand gallons of water? 
and it'll kill everybody. It'll squash, it'll stop. Revival happens. But I also, <laughs> I've had guys tell me, well, we're praying for a revival in our church. I said, here's how a revival starts in your church. Take a piece of chalk and draw a circle around your feet and then pray to God revival starts inside the circle. Okay? It's not something we're going to gin up or, or plan up or get going. It's something that God's going to do inside of you. I've watched it happen. Lucy and I had the blessing of living in a circumstance of God sent revival for almost 15 years in a church in Germany. Something, when I came back to the United States from Europe after being over there for 15, 16 years in that ministry over there, I was shocked at the lackadaisical attitude of most churches in America. Then I heard about John MacArthur. I said, yes, good, great, great. Then I realized there's a church of 10,000 people in a city of 12 million. See? God has done wondrous works. God, want, God, if we have our way, it's what's going to happen here, right? Do you want revival in this body? Do you want that? Your preacher does. See? What's it going to take? You have to know what the true gospel is. Let me have slide three. In the early fifth century, a British monk named Pelagius began to teach denying man's depravity. The testimony of scripture is that the sin of Adam is passed to every child, Romans chapter five. Pelagius taught that Adam's sin only affected us by the bad example that it set. In other words, you're born basically, Pelagius taught, you're born good and you learn to do bad. This is what's called environmental, uh, not stagnant, no, what's the word I want? You're, you're infected by your environment. In other words, you grow up in a bad environment, you grow up bad. If that's the case, I offer you a personal testimony. If my environment determines what I am, I should be an alcoholic, wife-beating adulterer because that's the environment I was raised in. Yet today I stand with this book open before you and declare the truth of God. Why? Why am I not environmentally affected by how I was born and how the environment that I was raised up in? Any of you have bad backgrounds? You should be different than, than what you are? Yeah, I would say most of us are. I'm glad that God doesn't do it like Pelagius said. We sin because we choose to sin. We are not basically good people that have gone bad. Do you understand that? Don't think of yourself that way. You deserve to be in hell. Is that clear? We have neglected, we have rejected, we have done what God said not to do instead of what he said to do, and therefore we are proving out that we are that he could righteously send us to hell, yet in grace, first in mercy, which is different than grace, mercy has affected everything, grace affects the elect. Mercy comes along and doesn't kill us, it allows us to be born and bring us to the point where he saves us, if he does that, and then in grace, we go along and we teach other people that, listen, I have the solution to the problem that affects you. Isn't that a marvelous message that we can bring to the world? Now, it's going to project itself through your personality. You're not going to do it the same way that I might do it. I had one young wife come to me one time and said, Howard, please tell Keith not to go to work on Monday morning and preach like you preached yesterday. Because he'll go to work and he burns them down, you know. He, he does all, you know, whatever. He was trying to be me in his environment. I told him, just, just be Keith in your environment because he was a wonderful man. And it made a, it made a world of difference. Pelagius based his teaching on the supposition that we are commanded to good activity in Scripture and God wouldn't command good from bad people, it would just frustrate us. In other words, uh, responsibility in his view um, uh, uh, required, required ability. If man wills to do good, he can do good. You don't need any outside help. All you need is what God is going to do for you. Well, Augustine came along, Augustine if you'd prefer it that way, he was also a monk at the same time. 
And when he grasped what Pelagius was teaching, he went on the offensive. He thrust home all the copious biblical evidence that it is not you that's saving yourself, it is God alone that is saving you. In the end, Pelagius was branded a heretic. But Pelagic teaching is appealing to the human libido, this positive self-image that we want to project of ourselves. The reality is Augustine taught that we don't add anything to what God is doing and God does not require anything of us. I tell you again, and we'll cover this more in depth when we get to it. I'm just giving you the, the overview. I know they're creating a lot of questions in minds, okay? The Council of Orange in 529 branded it as a heresy, what Pelagius was teaching, but in practice it took hold and it's still with us today under another name. If someone comes to you and says, if you will just sign this card or pray this prayer or get baptized or, be, or, 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 or make this profession of faith, then God will save you. What's wrong with that argument? It's not true. Tom says self-centered. He doesn't call, he doesn't, a lot of people refer to free will. Tom doesn't call it free will, he calls it self-will. I can't, I've got to make it something personal, see. Uh, let's, uh, let's, let's see, what time are we done? Quarter after? We're done. Um, keep your papers and we'll pick up uh, at this point next time, okay? I was vociferous. Okay, ask me questions quickly. We're going to have, we're going to have, go ahead, Ryan. Well, this, is, this is not a question, but I just want to give a statement. Um, Brother Howard is referring to, to Calvinism repeatedly, and some have bristled at that idea that we're following the teachings of a man. Um, Calvin was systematizing the teachings for us uh, in his institutes, and then later his followers gave us the five points of Calvinism in response to the five points of Arminianism. Right. Right. So don't get caught up on Calvinism. It's just the most convenient way to refer to the theology that's most broadly known. Right. Uh, we're just saying this is what biblical Christianity is. Right. Exactly. And that was point four. Amen. Good. Amen. Thank you. Let's have prayer and then we'll go. Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word and how precise it is. We pray that we would be students of it and live it, Father, as well as know it. In Christ's name, amen. Go in grace. See you next week if he's still around.